And in my opinion, the reason you're not seeing the kind of, uh, to the extent that you saw it in the 60s and 70s, the targeting of leftists in this country is because they don't see the left as a threat in this country in 2013. And so they have all these resources, and so the threat that they perceive is, is not so much from the left, but it's from, you know, the, you know, the, uh, you know, the minority population in this country where there's a disproportionate number of unemployed, underemployed, and people living uh, just, you know, below a subsistence level. And that means, you know, that George Jackson spoke, you know, wrote about this beautifully in in his book, Solidad, brother. Uh, You know, lock those people up or dispose of them. They, they, They can't do a mass extermination yet in this country. So they're doing it incrementally in terms of taking people out and locking them up. You know, those who don't die from social neglect, you know, they can't, you know, two and a half million people in this country locked up uh, would be two and a half million people on the unemployment line or working jobs where they can't support a family. And and so that's 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 why the you know that's so that's what the police are targeting now. You know, it's the poorest and darkest colored people in this country. I say um, it, it's my contention, and along with some of my comrades, that slavery was never abolished. The Thirteenth Amendment. Um, it actually legalized slavery or constitutionalized it because it states that involuntary servitude and slavery shall be abolished except for punishment for crime. And so what 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 I see is it, it, exactly what you just uh, described, the targeting of poor people, mainly uh, non-white people. Uh, and now we're seeing an increase in the private uh, prison industry, private prison corporations, um, but also the federal and state governments are also making money off of these people. Um, and so I, I see it as just a continuation of the uh, uh, slavery that this country was founded on. Well, you know, you're absolutely right. And if you, if you look at the history of the penitentiary system in this country and chain gangs and all of that, you look at the end, you know, of chattel slavery as it existed at that time, uh, you know, with the exception, as you pointed out, the 13th Amendment, um, you know, they had to come up with a way of, you know, social control that didn't include shadow chains. So that's where the penitentiary system really was formed, you know. And you look at the, uh, you know, the years, the, the black codes and, and, and uh, other statutes that were instituted after the end of shadow slavery, and that's, that's where you, you know, get to the convict leasing uh, uh, programs and policies that they had in this country at the time. Um, I mean, I had a unique experience uh where, uh, you know, after I came back from Vietnam, I was stationed in Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and I got out of service, and I decided to stay down there. Now, you know, I was politically imprisoned for 20 years, from 1984 to 2004, for political actions that I was convicted of. But prior to that, in 1969-1971, I was in prison in Tennessee State Penitentiary right after I got out of service. I had an honorable discharge. I had served in Vietnam. I got busted on it. I, was, I became politically active for the first time in my life, which was 1968, in Tennessee. I was busted in 1969 on small marijuana beef. And I heard $6 worth. Yeah. Wow. And I, got, I got five years in, in the Tennessee State Penitentiary. 
uh, with no prior criminal record at all. So when they talk about Vietnam vets getting spit on, which is basically a bullshit revisionist story that's been promoted by, you know, those who are still pissed off that the U.S. got beat in Vietnam because, you know, that's one getting spit on, you know. I never was. I never known any others that were. I was in Viet. I was a regional organizer of the Vietnam Veterans Against the War in the early seventies. I never met a Vietnam veteran that they ever get spit on. But that's they like to promote that. But I felt like I got spit on when I go to court and I get a five year sentence and they don't want to hear anything about I served in Vietnam. I had an honorable discharge because I'd been politically active at the time that I was busted. So I got I got the sentence. Anyways, I end up in the county jail under horrendous conditions, and uh, it's about half black, half white prisoners. And you know, we, uh, you know, we were sick, literally sick, because of the food there. We were being fed spoiled food, so we went on on a food strike, threw the food out, and said we can't eat this as well, you know. And I was a spokesman, and, um, you know, the sheriff promised that, you know, get everybody in order, and he, he would improve things the next day. Well, the next day they took me out and sent me to the Tennessee State Penitentiary because to get me out of the county jail to put an end to that strike. And so I, I arrived at the Tennessee State Penitentiary with that jacket, you know, on me, that file that says this guy's a troublemaker. And um, then, you know, it was a very segregated prison, and I, cro- you know, my co-defendant was black. I crossed the color line, you know, meaning, you know, I That's said, no, no. With- That's a no-no in a system of white supremacy. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> but anyway, so I was in, this is, this is a lot to the story, but the show isn't that long to get into it all. But the point is, I ended up in Brushy Mountain Prison in East Tennessee, from the main penitentiary in Nashville. Uh, and Brushy Mountain was the end of the line in uh, 1970 because, uh, uh, you know, that's where Death Row was. Uh, it was kind of, it was a lockdown prison, basically, you know, you hardly got out of your cell. And that's what they said, the troublemakers. And so they said after a while in, in, in Nashville, what's this, they classified me as a rage, racial agitator, and they sent me to Brushy. And, you know, Brushy was where James L. Ray was, the assassin of Martin Luther King. And, uh, but, but Brushy's history was that, that, you know, going back to like, and you can look this up on, online, um, there's not near as much on there online as it should be, and that's why people don't know their history because it's not there. But Brushy, Brushy Mountain Prison was started uh, during the convict leasing program. So when they were rounding up black people throughout the South after the Civil War, you know, all of a sudden they're walking down the street. You know, they don't they're not slaves anymore. You know, do something with these people and start locking them up, and you know, a lot of men up in Tennessee ended up in Brushy. And what they did was they mined coal. And the convict leasing program was that, you know, Brushy Mountain Prison is built right into the side of a mountain. The rear wall of the prison is the sheer face of the mountain. And they would march those prisoners into the mines. And to mine coal for private companies, okay? But so many of them were ended up getting killed that it caused an embarrassment for the state of Tennessee. So some, get this, reform-minded warden comes in and says, like, man, I can't have, you know, (laughs) dead bodies every month like this, you know? So what happened was the state of Tennessee took over the operation, and the convicts kept mining coal. But instead of mining it for corporations or companies, they were mining it for the state of Tennessee. So while uh, the deaths were reduced somewhat, eventually it got back to the same thing again. 
too many of them are losing their lives. And uh, I think in 1965 and 66, they finally stopped. And I was there only, I was there in 70, so I was, I was there only four or five years after that system stopped. And, uh, you know, the older cars, they would tell me that they were getting paid 25 cents a day to mine coal. Yeah. Some of the same things still going on today when I um, think back to the uh, BP oil spill and they were using Louisiana state prisoners, sending them down there to clean up. I think they might have been paying them a dollar a day, not providing them with uh, adequate uh, protection um, as far as hazmat suits and things of that nature. So, I mean, nothing, nothing has changed. And I try to impress upon people that is why we need a new generation of activists and people that are willing, you know, to do what's right. And one thing. I-